This lecture will be a continuation of the previous lecture on the bernstein sato polynomial. Um, so what we'll be doing in this lecture and the next lecture is showing how to prove the existence of, the, of this polynomial. Um, in fact, in the rest of this lecture we will hardly mention the, the bernstein sato polynomial at all. Instead, we'll be proving an inequality called Bernstein's inequality. Um, and this is an inequality involving modules over the Weyl algebra. So I'd better explain what the Weyl algebra is. Well, the Weyl algebra A is just the ring of polynomials over the complex numbers in, um, in variables x1 up to xn. So we've got a polynomial ring, but then we also introduce um, the partial derivatives of x1 up to xn. So I'm writing this as an abbreviation for differentiation with respect to x1 and differentiation with respect to xn. So this can be thought of as the ring of differential operators with polynomial coefficients. And you've got to be a little bit careful here because this is non-commutative. Um, it's pretty close to being commutative because xi xj is equal to xj xi and partial differentiation commutes at least if you're applying it to polynomials so these all hold and delta i xj is equal to xj delta i if i is not equal to j however delta i xi is equal to xi delta i plus one this is the Leibniz rule so it's pretty close to being a commutative algebra. The, the only thing that stops it being a commutative algebra is this, is this um, term 1 here. And so it's pretty close to being a commutative ring and we can in fact apply a lot of the techniques of commutative algebra to it. Um, we can also think of modules. Um, if M, so if M is a module over... Um, the Weyl algebra. Suppose it's the Weyl algebra modulo some ideal and since it's non-commutative you need to worry about whether it's a, a left ideal or a right ideal or whatever. But suppose we've got a cyclic module we can think of this as being a system of differential equations because each element of this ideal is going to be a differential equation so an ideal can be thought of as a collection of differential operators. And in particular, a homomorphism of modules um, over A from A over I to um, some ring of functions, say smooth functions. So the ring of smooth functions is, of course, a module over differential operators. So this can be thought of as solutions to the... Um, the differential equations in I. And if you think about it, a homomorphism from A to this, you just look at the image of one, and it's going to be a smooth function which is a which is a solution to all the differential operators in I. So the so the Weyl algebra can be sort of used to turn uh, the problem of solving differential equations into a problem uh, of linear algebra over this. Um, over this non-commutative ring. Of course this doesn't make the theory of differential equations trivial because this is actually quite a complicated ring and um, working out this is of course no easier than solving the differential equation but it, it gives you some new ideas for handling differential equations. Um, so uh, the first thing we want to do is to work out what is the centre of A. And the answer is the centre of A is just the complex number. So you remember A was equal to the algebra, uh, the, the, the sort of non-commutative polynomial ring over these. So it certainly contains C as a, as a subring. And the, the, the main point here is that it doesn't actually contain anything else. And the proof of this is quite easy. What we do is, if we've got a differential operator, 
we can map it to x d minus d x. And this is a C linear map from A to A. And it's, uh, it's actually really easy to work out what it is in the obvious in, in, in an obvious basis of A where the basis consists of a monomial in X times a monomial in these differential operators. So it should be X1. Um, and um, you can work out the kernel and you can work out the kernel of all the maps taking D to XI, D minus DXI for all I. And the kernel of all is is just the um, polynomials in x1 up to xn. And similarly, the kernel of um, d goes to delta i, d minus d delta i for all i, is um, just polynomials in delta 1 up to delta n. Notice there's actually a sort of symmetry between the, the, the partial derivatives and the x. In other words, there's actually an automorphism of this um, vial algebra which just switches the xi's with the di's up to sine or something. Um, anyway, um, we see that, that from this that anything commuting with all the xi and the delta i must be a polynomial in the x sign, also a polynomial in the di, so it must be in, in C. Um, should have a slight warning here. When you work out these, these linear maps and work out their kernels, we are actually using the fact that C has characteristic zero. So I should warn you, in characteristic P greater than zero, um, the, the, the center of the Weyl algebra is no longer trivial. So the center contains, for example, delta i to the p, because you actually find that x delta i to the p is equal to delta. It actually commutes with, with x, because um, um, the, the commutator turns out to be p times something. And if you work in characteristic p, that's actually 0. So the, the, the center is actually bigger in characteristic p than in characteristic naught. In some sense, the reason for this is that in characteristic p greater than naught, um, there are other differential operators. So in characteristic zero, this, this is all differential operators with polynomial coefficients. In characteristic greater than naught, there are other differential operators. You can think of these informally as being something like d to the p over p factorial. And you you have to be a bit careful here because we're in characteristic p, so we can't actually define division by p factorial. But we can sort of do this over the integers and then reduce it mod p, so it, so we get some extra differential operators. So anyway, in characteristic p, there there are additional complications, but we're we're not going to worry about these. We're just going to work over the complex numbers. So we found the center of the Weyl algebra. Um, now what we want to do is to convert the Weyl algebra into a commutative algebra. So we have a Bernstein filtration on A. So we have A0 contained in A1, contained in A2, and A0 is going to be the complex numbers. And AI is spanned by all monomials in x1 to xn, delta 1 to delta n, of degree less than or equal to i. So you're allowed to multiply most i of these together and then take the span of those. And remember these are non-commutatives, so you have to worry a little about, bit about the order, but we, we allow all monomials in any order. And then it's pretty obvious that ai times aj is contained in ai plus j. Um, the, 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 the other thing you notice is that um, um, if P is in AI and Q is in AJ, then PQ minus QP is actually in A to the I plus J minus 1. So um, 
Um, that, that sort of follows because it's true for monomials of degree 1. You remember xi times delta j is delta j times xi plus something in a0. And th th this property sort of propagates all the way through. So these, th what this means is that p and q, are, while they don't commute, um, they are... They, they sort of commute a little bit in, in some sense, that, that, that P, PQ times QP are both in AI plus J, but the difference is actually in AI plus J minus 1. So what we can do is we can look at the following graded ring. It's A0 plus A1 over A0 plus A2 over A1 and so on. And this is a commutative ring. And you notice it's sort of about the same size as the Weyl algebra, um, in some sense. And in fact, it's a polynomial ring in the images of the xi and the delta i. You remember the xi and the delta i, all of images in A1 modulo A0. And you can easily check this is just a polynomial ring in, in these elements here. So. So the Weyl algebra isn't too far away from being a polynomial ring. We can turn it into a polynomial ring by, by doing this filtration and grading trick. Now we want to do the same thing for modules. So, so suppose M is a module over A generated by um, a vector space I mean a complex vector space M0. Then we put Mi is um, just Ai M0. So, so we have Ai Mj is contained in Mi plus J. So we've, we've got a filtration on M and if we take M0 plus M1 over M0 plus M2 over M1 plus and so on, this is a module over the ring R, which is A0 plus A1 over A0, and so on. And in some sense, this module here is the same size as M, because we're, we're sort of, we've quoted out by M1 there, and we've got an M1 there, and so on. So in some vague idea, in some vague sense, you can think of this as being the same size as M. Well, now we can apply the theory of Hilbert polynomials to um, M. And let's assume that M0, the dimension of M0 is less than infinity. Here, here we're taking the dimension over the complex numbers. So it's finitely it's generated. So it's a finitely generated module over a, over a Noetherian ring of polynomials. So um, the dimension over the complex numbers of Mi is a polynomial in I for I sufficiently large, because this is what the theory of Hilbert polynomials tells us. And we define the dimension of M to be the degree of the dimension over C of Mi. Um, notice, by the way, there are two completely no different notions of dimension here. Here we've got the um, a sort of ring theoretic dimension So you remember in ring theory we defined the, the dimension of a ring or a module and it doesn't really have all that much to do with this dimension which is the dimension of a vector space. So don't confuse these two notions of dimension. They're, 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 they have, they're, they're, they're quite different. Um, well, and we can define the multiplicity of M to be the dimension of M factorial times the leading coefficient. And you remember, if we take the Hilbert polynomial and multiply its degree factorial times the leading coefficient, this is an integer. Um, well, you might think this is going to depend on m0. Well, it doesn't. The dimension of m and the multiplicity of m are independent of M0. That's because changing um, 
the basis M0, well M0 isn't quite a basis, but you can think sort of a, a basis of M0, just changes um, the Hilbert polynomial by at most a finite shift. And um, in other words, that if, if, if you add an extra element to M0, that the Hilbert polynomial of this new M0 and of the old one, uh, each is bounded by the other shifted by a constant. So they have the same degree and leading coefficient. Um, the lower coefficients of the polynomial do indeed depend on the choice of M0. So and they're more complicated to deal with, and we usually just ignore them. It's, it's the leading coefficient and the degree that, that, that are the most useful bits of a Hilbert polynomial because they tend to be much more stable under, under changing things. Um, so, um, in the commutative case, um, where M is a module over the polynomial ring in two n variables, dimension of m can be any integer from naught to 2n. For instance, if m has finite length, its dimension is zero. If it's the whole polynomial ring, it's its dimension 2n. And if you take this ring and quotient out by some of these xi's you get a module with some intermediate dimension. So you might guess that the same thing happens over the Weyl algebra, but, but there's a dramatic difference. Here we get Bernstein's inequality. It says that if m is not equal to zero, then the dimension of m is at least n. Um, it's trivial to show the dimension of m is less than or equal to 2n. So um, what has happened is that dimensions from 0 to n minus 1 are not possible in the, in the non-commutative case. Um, so um, what we're going to do in the rest of this lecture is just prove Bernstein's inequality. So let's have a proof. What we do is, is the key point is to show the map from A to HOM over C from M i to M 2 i is injective. Um, so suppose that A times M i is equal to zero, where A is in A i. We want to show that A is equal to zero. Just change pens, this one seems to be a bit temperamental. Um, we'll do by induction on I. So I less than zero is trivial, as A I is equal to zero. Um, assume true. For i minus one, um, so we, we, we so we've got a is an a i and a times m i equals zero. Then we have a times delta j, the, the commutator of a with delta j is an a um, i minus one, and a m i is equal to zero, so a delta j. Um, m i minus 1 is equal to 0, so a delta j is equal to 0 by induction. Similarly, a x j equals 0. I sort of mentioned that the x's and the, and the, and the deltas, or Dels or whatever you call this letter are, are sort of symmetric. So anything you can prove for one, you can prove from the other. So A is in the centre 
of the Weyl algebra. And you remember we worked out the centre of the Weyl algebra earlier. It was just um, um, multiple. It, it was just the complex numbers. So a is um, a complex number. And now we're just about done. So, um, so A is in C and A, M, I and, sorry, and A, M uh, equals zero. So, um, M, um, uh, so, so A M is equal to zero, and as M is not equal to zero, this is where we use the fact that module M is non-trivial, so we find that A must actually be zero. So, um, so this shows that A I is contained in HOM of M I to M two I. And now we can finish easily because um, the dimension over C is a polynomial of degree 2n. And the dimension of these um, is uh, are both polys of um, degree given by the dimension of M. That's the dimension over C and this is the ring theoretic dimension. So this side here is a polynomial of degree at most two times the dimension of M. And if you compare these two, we see that the, the dimension of M must be at least 2N over 2, which is equal to N, which is Bernstein's inequality. So, um, uh, the minimum possible dimension of a module over the Weyl algebra is therefore n rather than zero, as you might guess by analogy with the commutative case. If the dimension of m is equal to n, or m is equal to zero, m is called a holonomic um, module. Um, this is related to the notion of a holomo holonomic system of differential equations, in case you're wondering where the word term comes from. OK, so um, um, next lecture we're going to show how to use Bernstein's inequality to study holonomic modules and use properties of holonomic modules to um, prove the existence of the Bernstein polynomial.